Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar on sustainable energy for powering household and community lighting needs. This webinar is organized jointly by ICRC, Energypedia, and UNITA. My name is Ranisha Basnet, and today I'll be moderating this webinar along with my colleague Lisa Feldman from Energypedia. As you can see on the screen, this webinar is a part of a webinar series on sustainable energy in humanitarian settings. So we do invite you to have a look at all of our past webinars from June and September, where you can download the past presentations and also watch the webinar video. Along with that, we also have one more webinar coming up in November itself at 28 November, which will talk about sustainable energy for cooking in humanitarian settings. I do invite you to take part in the webinar and join us. Before we kickstart the webinar, a small tip. On the right side of your screen, you should see a box, um, like a control panel, and there you have an option called questions. Please use this box to send in your questions during the presentations. What we will do is we'll collect all your questions throughout the presentations and then towards the end where we have where we will have our Q&A session. We will then address the question to the respective speaker. So it would be great if you could tell us to whom it is addressed to, for example, speaker one, speaker two, or presentation one, presentation two, and that will help us to send it to the respective speaker. So let's kickstart the webinar by knowing a little bit about yourself. So what I will do is on your screen, you should now have a question popping up that um, where are you tuning today from? So please tell us if you are tuning from Asia, Africa, Europe. So I see a lot of answers are coming in. So I'll just okay. leave it for a few more seconds as the answers come in. Um, another few more seconds because I can still see people are typing in. So now I'll close the poll and display the result. So as you can see, today we have a lot of speakers uh, tuning in from Europe and followed by Africa, Asia and other continent. So welcome to all of you um, from wherever you are tuning in today and thank you for joining us today. And now I have one more question popping up in your screen. So please tell me which sector do you work? Are you working in the energy related NGOs, humanitarian and so on? So this is just to understand you, the audience better. Um, and I can see answers are popping in. So I'll just again leave it for a few more seconds. So two more seconds uh, as I can still see the answers coming in. So now I'll close the poll and then display the results. So today we have a lot of listeners coming in uh, who are working in the humanitarian NGOs and followed by energy related organization and companies. So we hope this webinar will be useful to all of you. So now let's go back to our webinar slides. And then I want to give you a brief, um, I want to quickly share the agenda for today. So as you know, we have four presentations today. Uh, the first presentation is from Lightning Global, followed by Oxfam, Mercy Cope, and Practical Action, where each of the presenter will share their experiences in um, different countries. And now I want to start our webinar with the first presenter for today, Chris. So Christa, Chris or Christopher Carlson has been working with uh, Lightning Global, a quality insurance program since 2009. And he has been involved in a number of activities such as product testing, field and lab research within the, uh, the global quality assurance program. And today, Chris is joined by his colleague, Nicole Asboris, who is, who is a part of the Lightning Global Business Development Team. And she also has been leading the program's work in displacement setting and has worked in different uh, strategies and different um, assignments like energy situation of Sweden refugees and so on. So Chris and Nicole, the floor is yours. I'm going to quickly load your presentation and un also unmute both of you so that you can start the presentation. So, so Chris, you are unmuted now and Nicole, I'm also quickly going to unmute you. So both of you are unmuted. And as you can see on the screen, you should be able to see your presentation. Okay. 
Chris, Nicole. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Chris Carlson from Lighting Global Quality Assurance. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, since we have a quite a short period of time to uh, to present, um, I'll be giving you a brief introduction to Lighting Global Quality Assurance, uh, touching on our quality standards for off-grid solar kits and the types of products that are currently supported. Uh, then shift over to the uh, concept of international standards harmonization, and most importantly, what, what this means in the context of the humanitarian aid sector. Uh, after that, I'll pass the mic over to Nicole, who will share lessons learned from Lighting Global's experience in um, protracted displacement situations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so very briefly, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Lighting Global QA program is part of the broader Lighting Global Market Development Program uh, run by the World Bank. Next slide. Uh, our, our program can be divided into three main components, uh, test methods and standards, testing and verification, and commuting, communicating quality to the market. Uh, next. Of note uh, is that our quality standards have been submitted to the International Electrotechnical Commission, and we're expecting uh, the IEC to adopt those quality standards early next year, which is pretty exciting for us. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a general overview of our quality standards. Um, again, for those of you who are not familiar, um, our quality standards are the most widely recognized internationally for these types of products. Uh, they cover Pico PV products um, with solar modules less than one watt up to 10 watts and larger solar home system kits um, that go all the way up to PV modules with 350 watt peak. Uh, of note, the, um, the standards set baseline levels for quality, durability, and truth in advertising with a key focus on protecting consumers. Uh, it's also notable that the standards are non-prescriptive and technology neutral, meaning that um, they don't set any minimum performance requirements and they don't require any uh, particular component types. So um, that allows uh, manufacturers and designers to be innovative when, when they're designing uh, products that uh, are most suitable for, um, for the users. Um, to determine if the products meet our quality standards, they need to be tested according to the IEC test methods um, from uh, accredited uh, third-party test centers. Next slide, please. Uh, here to give you a taste of um, the type of products that, that uh, we're dealing with, um, I've broken it down into the, uh, please go back, thank you, um, into the, the two types of product categories we have, uh, Pico PV and solar home systems. Uh, you can see on the smaller end, um, we're talking about um, primarily lighting. Uh, oftentimes these products uh, provide mobile phone charging and, and possibly um, power other small appliances. Um, in terms of the sustainable energy for all multi-tier framework, um, these smaller Pico PV products um, can provide up to tier one um, energy access for uh, more than one person and possibly up to a household. Then moving up to the larger range of, of solar home system kits, uh, you can see that since they have uh, larger batteries and larger PV modules, they can also provide more energy services to the users. Uh, so they often include appliances such as uh, fans, TVs, radios, and um, obviously lighting. Um, so when we move towards the larger end of that spectrum, these products can um, provide up to tier two uh, energy access for households. Next, please. Uh, so for those of you on the, the webinar, uh, I encourage you to go to our Lighting Global website and check out the product database. Uh, you can find a wealth of information about all of the products that have been quality verified. Uh, and you can also download um, specifications for, for the, all of those products, as well as uh, type approval documents that can be used to um, verify that a particular product, product does comply with the standards. Next slide, please. Uh, it's also important to understand what's outside of the current scope of our quality assurance program. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, it's uh, limited to products that are under 350 uh, watts peak. 
Um, and the systems currently that we support only have DC uh, direct current output. So AC systems or AC appliances are not included. Uh, custom designed uh, component-based solar home systems are also currently outside of the scope as are uh, standalone and productive use appliances such as TVs, fans, solar water pumps, and the like. Um, I do want to mention here that uh, we are uh, working um, to develop a quality assurance framework for component-based solar home systems. Um, and my colleagues at CLASP are also exploring the development of a QA framework for uh, standalone and productive use appliances. Um, so on the CLASP side, um, under the uh, LEIA program, um, they're seeking feedback from stakeholders to identify needs for those appliances um, and what types of products they're interested in. Um, so if any organizations on the webinar are, are interested in using a QA framework for procurement decisions for these types of appliances, um, please feel free to contact me and I can put you in touch with my colleagues um, on the LEIA program that are, are developing that framework. Next slide, please. Here, just to give you a taste of um, where uh, uh, standards for these products are being adopted and considered, uh, you can see there's a pretty uh, large concentration in uh, Africa and Asia. Um, next slide, please. And now as our quality standards are being um, transitioned to the IEC, uh, we are expecting a pretty short-term expansion of uh, countries and regions that will be aligning their uh, national and regional uh, quality assurance frameworks with, um, with ours. Uh, so this should give you a, a pretty good idea of um, how expansive this is, is getting to be. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so talking about standards harmonization, um, here is to give you a, a general idea of um, the importance of, of why uh, we want to have um, internationally harmonized standards. Uh, pretty much across the board, um, consumers and markets, standards agencies and governments, and other stakeholders all benefit uh, in, in different ways from referencing the same set of, of quality standards. Next slide, please. Now, specifically honing in on humanitarian aid organizations, uh, there are several ways that you can um, benefit from uh, using harmonized uh, quality standards for these products. Um, so organizationally, you can increase the confidence in the, the products that you're procuring, which ultimately reduces the programmatic risk. Uh, you can have strength in tenders, uh, for example, referencing um, the Lighting Global database of quality verified products as well as our technical support. Um, you can um, have increased product selection, um, transparency, and, and really facilitate the whole um, development of uh, the, the technical requirements and the, the process of uh, bid evaluation. Um, and more broadly, like I said, we're protecting consumers, uh, we're aligning our approach with governments and other programs, and believe it or not, these procurements that the humanitarian uh, aid organizations are doing um, do support sustainable market development um, and encourage um, product quality and innovation. Um, and my last slide. So what can you do now? I encourage everyone to, to learn more. So please go check out our, our Lighting Global website where we have a, a, a wealth of resources and um, we can also offer some great guidance from um, my, my talented uh, colleagues. Um, insist on quality. So um, that's a pretty basic one. Uh, if you're if you're looking to procure uh, products, um, it's a good idea that they meet international standards. Um, know the regulations in the countries that that you're operating. So if you're looking to procure uh, products for use in Kenya, for example, make sure that the products you're you're getting are aligned with uh, those national standards. Um, also, uh, understand your beneficiaries. So um, to make sure that you're getting the, the best, most appropriate products, um, we all need to know what the user's energy needs and, and expectations are. And finally, um, we all um, should focus on creating awareness. So 
Um, this includes um, people within our own organizations, um, other organizations that we work with, as well as the users to, to really reinforce the importance of, of, of product quality. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, and thank you everyone for joining. So I'll be talking to you about um, what the private sector looks at whenever entering a new market, specifically in displacement situations. And at the same time, tell you more about what we found in Lebanon in 2018. Just to give you a small overview, Lighting Global is a joined IFC World Bank program, has been active in the market for more than 10 years now uh, in the solar off-grid commercial market. And our programmatic approach is based on quality assurance as Chris said, on business development uh, from the IFC side and on support to governments from the World Bank side. So um, one uh, here I uh, listed a couple elements of uh, whenever a company is looking into going in, in a new market, what are the elements that um, uh, it will look into. And a market assessment is um, is one of them and that's exactly what we did in Lebanon in 2018. Next slide, please. Um, we <clears throat> so on the left you can see a small summary, a really really summarized um, uh, table of what the lighting of what the private sector would look at whenever entering a new market. And I will use this as a filter and template to tell you more about what we found in Lebanon. So why do we look at the current expenditure and in income? Of course, we want to understand what can people currently afford. Um, how much are they spending and the importance that the population gives to energy. And that is directly um, reflected in the portion of income that people spend on energy. And here we can see that the Lebanese host communities spend about 10% of their income, Syrian refugees in camps spend 18% of their income, and Syrian refugees in rented accommodations um, spend 23% of their income. And this is based on a um, cohort of uh, 740 households that we interviewed. Next slide, please. Um, on the next slide, we're going to look at power uh, supply and energy needs. We look at this because we want to understand what is the most appropriate technology uh, to be deployed. And we found out in Lebanon, not surprisingly, I have to say, if anyone here on the webinar knows something about Lebanon, the grid is highly unreliable. There are uh, load sheddings starting at three hours in Beirut and increasing more and more when um, <clears throat> going further away from uh, the capital. So people use generators as backups. Syrian refugees and camps are outliers in this in the sense that they are the ones who rely the most on grid and generators separately. And there's a reason for this because sometimes the uh, camps uh, might be in rural areas, uh, in remote areas, even though Lebanon is pretty small. But those areas could not, might not be reached by the grid and so they use generators. Or because energy is pretty expensive, uh, even though it's subsidized by the government in Lebanon, but sometimes um, 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 they they're not um, the gen grid is generators are too expensive, so they just rely on the grid and go through the power outages. We also looked at the appliances that these people use, um, and here you can see that the usage of these appliances is pretty high, with pretty high loads such as refrigerators. Um, next slide, please. Um, whenever um, we also looked at the supply side um, and we interviewed 68 retail shops, um, why do we look at the supply side? We do so because we want to understand how easy or hard it would be for a company to potentially find a distributor. And we look at financing options because um, it is crucial in the moment when a company needs to price the product that they're looking to sell. And here, um, the results are not surprising. 75% do not sell any solar products, 50% do not provide retail financing, and only 9% would finance refugees. And finally, next slide, please. Um, we um, uh, we um, uh, make a uh, estimation of the market. And here we estimated a potential demand of 20,000 20, to 25,000 solar home systems with a potential market of $5 million. 
Um, important to say is that we assumed an average of $200 uh, per kit, and we identified as main targets, and that's also an important thing, you, to identify the main target customers to be Syrian, in this case, to be Syrian refugees in camps and rented accommodations. Next slide, please. And so as a final slide, I just wanted to tell you what we think that these results tell us. So number one, previous living conditions are extremely important because they um, shape energy use whenever more, even more than current affordability levels. And we've seen that just by looking at how much these people are spending on energy. They're spending a big chunk of their, of their income. And that has a direct um, effect on the right technology to be chosen whenever going into a new market. Um, of course, the technology that is chosen, for example, in MENA is completely different from the technology in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and so this was um, a, um, a, a effort, part of a, bigger, um, uh, of a bigger objective to create and to make available uh, more data and information about protracted situations to the sector. But even so, this data is becoming more and more available. Uh, these uh, untapped markets are still perceived as too risky by the private sector. And so what do we recommend? We recommend to involve MFIs since the beginning because these people might not have the right liquidity on hand to pay upfront for these products. But in general, that's not very different from commercial rural settings. So we're used to that. And then pilot interventions are essential. So we need to concentrate on those for for the moment to reduce market entry risks for companies. Thank you. And here, one last thing, we have useful resources um, which you can access uh, by clicking on them and they're all on our website. Thank you. So thank you both Chris and Nicole for giving an overview on the, um, the quality standards. And as Chris mentioned, if anyone's interested, please feel free to contact him. And thank you, Nicole, to also highlighting the, the, the potential for private sector to get involved and how they could get involved in the, in the delivery of this kind of energy services. Now I would like to go back to my original presentation. So allow me to skip through a few slides um, because these are the same slides you already saw it. So I'll just quickly skip through them. And then now we come to the another presenter for today. And now for the, the next presentation, I would like to welcome Rachel Hesty from Oxfam. Rachel has more than 16 years of experience in humanitarian field and currently she's working as a protection team leader for the global humanitarian team. And today she's going to talk about Oxfam's experience in the sustainable lighting sector. So Rachel, the floor is yours. I'm gonna now unmute you so that you can continue with the presentation. Uh, it seems like I just sent you a request to unmute yourself. Uh, so if you could just, um, yeah, you are back there. Great, thank you very much. Um, so, in the last couple of years, Oxfam has been doing some research with Loughborough University, uh, funded by the Humanitarian Innovation Fund. And this was looking at whether sanitation lighting, so for example, lighting at communal latrines in refugee and displacement camps reduce risks of gender-based violence. So it was quite wide scope. Um, and we had findings in, in all those areas, GBV, uh, water and sanitation, camps and so on. I'm just gonna pull out um, for the next few minutes, um, some of our findings around lighting. As part of the research, we um, worked in three camps, which were more or less in their first phase. People were just arriving. So first phase of an emergency. Um, and they were in Iraq, Nigeria and Uganda. And as part of the research, we, we did a baseline and then we put in um, different lighting solutions in each each camp. One was handheld solar lights, one was fixed wall lights, and, and in another we put lamp posts. So I'm just going to tell you a bit about that. You can see in, there's much more detail in our research than I can possibly present today, um, but um, you can see here the um, the uh, 
web address. And I would like to point out, if you look on the left-hand side, there's a, in the middle of those documents, there are eight case studies uh, specifically on lighting, including the locations we, we were in, plus South Sudan, Lebanon, and Bangladesh. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So our main findings are that um, the demand for lighting everywhere were, was evident. Uh, people talked about it as a basic need, um, that they needed multiple forms of lighting, and that all household members needed lighting. This was not seen as a luxury, definitely a basic need. Um, in general, we were looking at safety in our research, and it does, having lighting makes people feel safer, um, but, but just worth noting that actual um, improving safety, particularly women and girls' safety, it can only ever be a contributor towards that. There are many other factors, particularly in camps, that need to need to be addressed um, around site security. Uh, in, in, in the case of our research, the build and quality of um, latrines, locking doors, those kind of things. Um, we found that even where there was a blanket distribution of uh, a solar lamp to every household in the camp, uh, men had two or three times more access or, um, than women and girls. Uh, women and girls were often resorting to using very low-tech forms of lighting, so um, the uh, sticks or grass that uh, they would light at night, candles, kerosene, also much more dangerous types of lighting. Uh, men were much more likely to be using mobile phones as a source of light, but overall I was very surprised to find um, how high the dependency on battery torches um, was everywhere um, that we went. And a general trend, men have much more access. If a household has one light, men are much more likely to be using that for all sorts of reasons. Um, we also found lighting provides all, a, a lot of benefits beyond safety, improving family and community interactions, uh, it lengthens the day, studying markets, um, and so on. And a big problem that we had everywhere was this lack of coordination in the humanitarian sector. No one quite knows where lighting beyond belongs. In Uganda, it was the GBV um, group that was coordinating on lighting. And then when there were lighting inputs, for example, in the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh, there were, it, it was very hard to get an overall lighting strategy. Um, so um, lots of agencies were doing very uncoordinated things that didn't uh, contribute to to an overall strategy and also technical support is, was a real problem um, we found that quality really varies on what people have they face a, a lottery really of the quality um, so for example, when I was in Bangladesh, Oxfam was giving two very good quality lights. We use Lighting Global um, to help us decide what kind of lights we, we will buy, um, an excellent uh, resource. And um, I could go to the family at the next kind of block along and find they had something you wouldn't even give to a child in this country that they reckon gave them a best 20 minutes of light a day. So, so that kind of lottery is really problematic. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? So um, I've mentioned the multiple multiple forms of lighting. For this, we're really talking about the, the same thing, I guess I would expect in my own environment, um, what we might call street lights uh, or, or, or um, public lamp posts. You can see a picture of one we, we installed on the right. Um, also household lighting, so something you can hang in a shelter that gives an ambient light, but also um, lighting for tasks, um, which could be homework, could be cooking and chopping or repairing things. And also the individuals needed lighting to go around. Sharing, sharing one torch or one lamp did not work, really didn't work for people. Um, People like solar, really, really valued so solar, um, but were actually using a lot of battery torches uh, with the cost of batteries and sometimes the danger of going to markets um, where, where they might be uh, attacked or, or put at risk on the way. And the functionality make, makes a difference. Um, so if uh, a solar light has 
um, a mobile phone charger that was valued by lots of people but it did affect who had access and how it was used and of course when we found that many many more men had mobile phones than women the gender dimension comes in very strongly um, I, I, I was talking to a, a woman who was trying to cook, cook in the dark in Uganda and asked, well, do you not have a lamp? And she said, yes, yes, we got the UNHCR lamp, which is a great sunbell, very nice quality lamp. But her husband had gone into the local town and he needed it to charge his mobile phone. And so sometimes we were thinking, well, if we don't put the charger, will that increase women and girls access if the mobile phone issue uh, is problematic? Uh, mobile phones, of course, are an additional source of light as well to a household. Um, people really wanted the high quality. Uh, if you do look at the case studies, there's one from Lebanon where we gave communities a number of lights to test out and they really wanted um, the best quality they could get. Uh, they really value sustainable um, solution solar was very valued um, and uh, when we've when we've given out lights we always look to see is there a local supplier who offers a warranty as well so they can they can go and exchange it if it stops working which has worked very successfully in Bangladesh and we also looked at we were doing public lighting I think all over the world there are camps there are communities with these graveyards of solar lighting systems that have just fallen into disrepair they've been vandalized um, no one's taken ownership of them they've not been able to sustain them often due to short-term funding but also that the community really does not feel ownership of them if they're not involved from the beginning um, next slide please so for the future um, sustainability obviously is is the key theme um, we we thought when we were talking to all the many many people we spoke to during the research that there is a massive potential for innovation in how lighting is delivered um, less so in um, for us as humanitarians in what what the actual lights are and the technicalities of them because the market's really taking care of that um, but looking at different ways to deliver so um, I, th I think a lot of lighting at the moment in, in places I've been is very much that you know, just delivering boxes off the back of trucks kind of thing, slightly more sophisticated, but the, the potential for innovation is huge. We did some work on market-based approaches in Bangladesh. That's one of the case studies, really interesting, uh, using cash and vouchers, but using those with local traders, encouraging traders to actually improve the quality of what they're offering and to work on um, making using that kind of approach to bring together refugees and host communities uh, for example where where there are a lot of tensions um, we worked on community-based public lighting where we had um, maintain, community maintenance committees that looked after the lighting uh, that was really useful when it came to things like uh, antisocial behavior uh, vandalism and theft um, we also oh and potentially for income generation I'm just going to leave that for the moment um, because maybe I, I don't think there's time to go into it um, there's really a strong need in the humanitarian sector for for this kind of coordination um, having strategies and having strong technical guidance we found quite a lot of lamps uh, uh, um, street lights in camps we were we were visiting just had things misaligned weren't quite working um, you know they were not being installed correctly so so people didn't get the full value of them and then the final point I would say is that designing with people thinking about gender disability thinking about power dynamics but also the huge potential for innovation for community-led projects um, that the energy sector and lighting in particular offers there's just one final slide and and this is if you can go forward this is just a, a, a little bit from the report which is quite a short summary summary report and you can see here we've tried to outline some of the key things to think about in terms of doing needs assessment and talking to people and deciding what you want to do in lighting um, so I'd encourage you to use that Um, thank you, Rachel. Then I'll just 
quickly go to the next slide. Um, first of all, thank you once again for um, talking about the different issues that you encounter and also sharing your experience. Perhaps this webinar can be also a starting ground to do, talk more about what could be a common strategy for lightning, especially in the humanitarian sector could be. And the topics that you mentioned, like the gender dimension or the graveyard problem, could also be something that our audience are experiencing in their program. So maybe we could have more discussions about that in the discussion sections. And now I would like to move forward to our next presenter for today, um, Cecilia Ragazzi. She's working with Mercy Corps for more than 10 years and is currently is the C um, sorry, Senior Advisor for Humanitarian Partnership on Energy Access and has worked in um, different humanitarian contexts in different countries. Today, Cecilia is joined by her colleague Bariali Siddiqui, who has been working in Mercy Corp Afghanistan for more than seven years and especially expanding the renewable energy portfolio of Mercy Corps Afghanistan. And today, Siddiqui will especially join us during the Q&A session. So feel free to send in all your questions and type, us, type in the chat box. So one more time, on the right side of your screen, there is a chat box uh, or a question section. So just type in your questions and we'd be more than happy to pass it to the speakers towards the end. So now, um, Cecilia, I'm going to quickly unmute you so that you can begin with your presentation. So you, could, you can now begin with the presentation. Hello, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to speak about how Mercy Corps delivers energy products and services in humanitarian settings. It's actually great to come after the Lighting Global presentation, as what Chris and Nicole shared with us is so relevant to our strategy. Um, really, they both talked on the importance of quality products and the need to increase access to financing services, which is exactly what we are trying to facilitate. And uh, also Rachel mentioned of a market-based approach calls directly uh, to our work, um, because this is what we do at our core. Um, so this is a really a very exciting play place uh, to be for us today. Thanks. Um, so. When we speak about access to energy in our humanitarian settings, um, we are really very conscious that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, at Mercy Corps, we really try to, to take a close look at what communities need, um, especially to increase their resilience. And uh, then we develop different models to ensure that communities have the capacity to develop from within. So I would like to start with a brief introduction of our general approach to access to energy and humanitarian response, and then I'll present you with a brief case study on Afghanistan. Uh, so my colleague Baralai is the portfolio manager for access to energy programming in Afghanistan, and he will be available for any clarifications. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Mercy Corps is a... Uh, uh, not this one, the previous one, maybe? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> Mercy Corps is a leading global non-governmental organization. Uh, we work in more than 40 countries um, and 90% of our staff, uh, we are about 6,000, come from the countries of implementation. So a deep uh, no, uh, knowledge from the context where we work. Um, as you can see in uh, this diagram, at the core of our strategy, uh, we have uh, partnerships. We partner with the civil society organizations, government and uh, private sector actors to help people overcome adversity and build secure, productive and just communities. Um, so to do so, after a man-made or a natural shock, we operate at a system level. So trying to address really the root causes of any crisis to try to allow communities to bounce back stronger. Now, if we can go to the next slide, thanks. So as many of you in this call, um, we are really focused on uh, realizing SDG 7, ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Um, this is at the core of our approach to access to energy in humanitarian settings. So this for us means that energy is really a means to reach and amplify our development objectives that we have throughout our portfolio. 
So, for instance, if I think about a food security program and I couple it with access to energy, um, the connection to an electric meal to make flour comes quite naturally. Or if I think about the health sector, a fridge to store vaccine. So, we think about access to energy in terms of market system development, which is really in our DNA. Through market system development, uh, our teams uh, try to anal analyze the supply and demand for, for energy goods and services to try to support the economic growth and ultimately improve the social outcomes of the communities where we intervene. So what we do normally is to start with a market assessment where we identify both barrier but also market-based solutions. So this means that our project teams really adopt a light touch role. Um, we try to create uh, more than anything linkages between market actors to deliver uh, in the long term those products and services that are needed rather than just coming in, distribute a bunch of products and then leave. So I know that <laughs> because it's been uh, mentioned previously that uh, other people are doing the same in this call. And I think that we all know that there are no easy models to do this, but we really believe that trying to be context specific um, could work to make mar market actors uh, um, develop the communities of intervention. So we know that applying these uh, systems is quite challenging, especially in humanitarian settings. And at the same time, as humanitarian organization, we have the imperative of do no harm. So this means that we really must adapt our approach to the different contexts. And uh, we do so starting to differentiate between acute, and protective settings. And then we try to propose the most effective and sustainable solution. If you go to the next slide, please. So in this slide, I'm trying to show um, a little bit of the challenges, but also the opportunities that we are seeing in the field. And I'm sure that many of you, of course, are aware of all of these. So more than uh, 1 billion people live without electricity, and 80 to 90% of the displaced people rely on biomass for cooking and lighting. 3 billion people use solid fuel for cooking, causing 4 million deaths annually. Um, these uh, figures are definitely shocking, but we also see an opportunity. So in the countries where we operate, People are already paying for energy, as Nicole said, uh, um, the turnout of money is quite considerable. Uh, but often people pay for unhealthy, unreliable and unsustainable energy. Um, overall, 27 billion USD per year are spent on, uh, on energy. We also know that the technology is moving fast and the prices are dropping. So this can increase the supply of clean, reliable and sustainable energy services at the household level for productive uses for institutions. And we know also that there are private investments worth millions of USD out there. And uh, there are increasing flexible financing systems that have been developed. I'm thinking, for instance, about pay as you go through mobile phones. Um, next, please. So we said that we really tried to put a context around the world, around what we do, right? So um, I would like to start differentiating uh, uh, between acute emergencies and protective crises. So when we think about an acute emergency, I'm thinking about, for instance, the Nepal earthquake or the typhoon in the Philippines. So in the initial stage of a crisis, Mercy Corps provides directly the essentials of survival. So we really try to help mitigating the risks and the exposure to threat. But it's also true that very quickly, we try to transition toward the recovery programming. So in what we do, we try to, to meet the best global practices and standards, and this includes also access to energy programming. So for instance, uh, we have developed a, ma a master purchase agreement to quickly deploy lighting global certified equipment within the 48 hours uh, uh, after a crisis uh, strikes. So after these very first few days, uh, we tried to transition toward the emergency cash transfers instead of in-kind of distributions. So through cash transfers, we really think that we can empower people uh, buying what they need the most. And we really think that this is a very dignifying 
uh, way of delivering humanitarian programming. Uh, next, please. Uh, but we also said that uh, we work in a complex, protracted crisis. Um, this could be Afghanistan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Yemen, or Syria. So in this context, our humanitarian work extends over years, not just months. Um, the picture that you have, uh, it's of a building that is actually a teaching hospital in Afghanistan that is now solar powered, um, thanks to a program that I'm going to um, explain to you just in a few slides. So our work in access to energy through market system development in this complex crisis facilitates the entrance of quality products and services into the market. And we do so trying to leverage the market systems that are already existing. Um, so we continue to push for frequent practical market analysis uh, in the most severe situations to really try to, to strengthen the communities from within. Um, so, the uh, spotlight of this presentation is going to be in Afghanistan, where we are working with utilities and energy companies to try to, to engage with communities to co-design solar and hybrid infrastructure. If you can go next, please. Um, so, just a quick background on Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, over half of the population is without reliable electricity, and this, of course, hinders the economic and social development. Uh, Mercy Corps Afghanistan initiated its journey to renewable energy, developing a model through which solar technology can become more available. So initially, to, do, <laughs> to open up this new portfolio, our team carved a small pot of money from a bigger program that was funded by DFID, and they tried to test a build to operate lease transfer ownership, uh, we shortened it in Bolto, um, in the Elman province. And this was to power the university and the teaching hospital that you saw in the picture before. Then we tried to, to, uh, brought, to bring this model to a larger scale, thanks to funding from Expo. And uh, we had a program called uh, a Building a Reliable Energy System and Helping Normalize Access. And we like to shorten things, so Breshna. Um, and uh, this program tried to make solar energy affordable for households and businesses, uh, while still keeping the technology reliable and next um, and of a high quality. If you can go next, please. So um, this is clearly a map of Afghanistan, but also it shows the partners with whom we needed to collaborate to make this program possible. So this partner includes uh, the Kabul University for Renewable Energy Lab, which tested uh, the products for quality assurance, the Afghan Renewable Energy Union, which provided access to quality solar installers, microfinance institutions, including OXIS, that gave access to financing for larger scale systems and the Ministry of Energy and Water, with a setting actually renewable energy policies. So the Breshna uh, operating model builds on the market ecosystem um, to ensure that more installation using the build to operate lease transfer ownership model can be done. Mercy Corps is really, again, trying to play a facilitating role to ensure that uh, through this model, there's an increased demand for solar installation. And uh, we try to aggregate as much as possible the bidding requirements to lower the cost for the consumers. In this way, trying to support all the players in uh, the market. If you can go next, please. So here we have another map of Afghanistan. And uh, the idea behind it is that uh, our market assessments demonstrated that private enterprise potential in Afghanistan is actually constrained by a lack of uh, um, access to clean, reliable, and affordable electricity. Um, we know that when electricity is available, uh, access can be very sporadic, and we have uh, long uh, hours of blackouts that disrupt the commercial activity daily life in general, but uh, averagely there are uh, losses about 10% annually in uh, business incomes. Um, renewable energy technologies are also not new to Afghanistan. However, there's definitely a legacy of a poor quality system, uh, a lack of functioning marketplace, 
and donor funds that have distorted the market prices and have created an environment that, that doesn't really support the sector maturation. And uh, on the other hand, does it really incentivize customers to invest in high quality solar uh, systems? Um, if we can go next. I would like to walk you through the original thinking of our Bolto model that involved an initial technical assessment um, that investigated the load needs, the exposure, the availability of space of potential candidates um, for these uh, solar uh, systems. And uh, this was carried out by our uh, renewable energy department. And, uh, this department selected uh, um, potential customers that then uh, underwent a financial assessment by our financial partner, Oxus. So at the end of these uh, two-sided assessments, we had uh, approved clients that received a package of leasing and uh, technical services along with uh, the customized solar package uh, um, adapted for their needs. And uh, this was installed by qualified en engineering procurement and construction installer. So under uh, the Breshna project, we tested uh, um, this model with uh, um, 11 sorry, uh, businesses and households. And uh, the systems that we install ranged from uh, 3 kilowatt peak to 20 kilowatt peak. And uh, the total beneficiary were uh, 1,744 people. So uh, we also knew that uh, to scale up uh, this model, we required uh, increased dedica dedicated financing systems. So the upfront cost of a solar photovoltaic system is still unaffordable for the majority of Afghans. So we really needed to develop tailored leases that could come from microfinance institutions that could fit within the monthly incomes that people make in Afghanistan. So we tried to develop the model further and you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and uh, we developed a new proposal that is uh, still pending for approval, so fingers crossed. Um, this program is called the Frontier Energy Platform, or FAP, uh, Power to Empower. So this is really like a model for advancing the commercial and institutional solar photovoltaic system uh, in Afghanistan as a viable energy solution. So the program consortium really developed from uh, the initial Breshna program and try to optimize on the unique sectorial and geographical strength of each partner that was part of Breshna. So uh, the program will bridge the gaps to installing and using solar photovoltaic systems by providing financial and technology advisory services to businesses in urban and peri-urban areas in six provinces, Kabul, Kandahar, mazar sharif Herat, Jalalabad, and Talukan. Um, the program has uh, four objectives that are really about building a scalable model to increase access to affordable, reliable and clean energy for Afghan businesses, uh, all improving the consumer confidence uh, for uh, um, these systems, advancing the capacity of the local installers and the financing institution to meet a growing demand, and uh, establishing a pathway um, for Afghan um, businesses to try to, to expand their revenue and uh, opportunities for export growth. So throughout this program, we are really hoping to reach at least 200 businesses and households that are divided in three segments uh, that would utilize systems under 20 uh, kilowatt peak, under 150 kilowatt peak, and over 150 kilowatt peak. So the difference is quite uh, wide. Um, and as you can see from the slide, uh, we have uh, what we call critical functions. We have uh, five of them. The first one, uh, again, is really to try to, to assess the technical and financial feasibilities of potential clients. The second one uh, speaks about tendering for the installation services. And again, especially for the smaller systems, we're really trying to aggregate the demand to cut the cost. The third one, uh, it's around the investment facilitation and really trying to increase access to financial services. The fourth one is about operation and maintenance. 
Um, so not only we wanted to have qualified, qualified installers, but they must also provide uh, warranties for the systems that they put in place. And the final one uh, is really collaboration on uh, policy and uh, regulatory engagements with the national authorities. So to do all this, we tried to, to create uh, two funds, and uh, this is, I think, a little bit uh, one of the beauties, honestly, of this uh, program. The first fund uh, covers really the upfront cost of the initial procurement and the installation. Well, the second, uh, the second fund is uh, a revolving capital fund that uh, sits in a dedicated bank, bank account managed by Mercy Corps and is replenished by the installments that are paid from the clients. And uh, this revolving fund is then used to install additional system, increasing, of course, the impact of the project. Um, so I hope that this is uh, clear enough and of course, if you have uh, any questions, uh, Barala and myself will try to answer uh, on the Q&A session. And uh, um, you have also the slide uh, with some of uh, our uh, references. And for anything, uh, just uh, shoot an email. Thanks. Thank you, Cecilia, for shedding light on your Afghanistan project. And I'm pretty sure um, it was a really nice example for other people to learn, uh, learn about and also the highlight on the different delivery models that you and both Rachel also talked about is something I think our audience will be really keen to know more about. So again, I encourage everyone to type in their questions. So we are happy to receive as many questions as you want to send us. And now I want to move forward with our last presentation for today. And for that, I would like to invite Philip Sandwell. Philip is currently working as a research associate at Practical Action at Empirical College London, where he's researching the implementation of energy projects in developing countries and especially humanitarian settings. He, also, he has also previously worked for the Renewable Energy for Refugee Project and also holds a PhD in physics. So Philip, I'm gonna unmute you so that you can start with your presentation. So Philip, now you're unmuted and you can begin with the presentation. Great, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of our um, project level experiences from the Renewable Energy Ref for Refugees project or RE4R. Uh, today I'll be focusing on solar home systems in three refugee camps in Rwanda. So next slide, please. Uh, so who are Practical Action? So Practical Action is an international development organization we have a presence around the world, um, but focus on some key areas, sustainable energy um, and clean cooking is one of them, but also um, agriculture, water and waste management, climate change and disaster resilience too. But the Renewable Energy for Refugees Project or RE4R is a partnership between Practical Action and UNHCR and funded by the IKEA Foundation. We're also supported by our project partners, Chatham House, Norwegian Refugee Council and Energy for Impact. And the high-level goal of this project is to deliver market-based renewable energy investments in humanitarian settings. The way we do this is in two locations. One is in urban settings in Jordan, um, which is not the focus of this presentation. What I'm going to focus on is uh, camp settings in three camps in Rwanda called Gehembe, Kigeme, and Yabaheke. Uh, these are three protracted situations um, with people displaced from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Next slide, please. So this is a kind of general um, overview of the process that we used for each of the RE for our interventions. I'll give some more details about each of the steps individually later. Um, we started off with an assessment phase, which lasted for around about a year of um, data collection, given that the situations we were working in had um, essentially no information about people's energy access. So we need to gather that kind of primary data ourselves. The next step in the process was co-designing solutions so this was working with local and national stakeholders so unhcr government agencies responsible for refugee affairs and energy um, local ngos um, and could also involve other local companies suppliers or other experts in the field our next step was to engage with suppliers so this is going to be the focus of our um, presentation this was done through initial advertisements of kind of what we were doing a bit of um, sharing information about our process and goals um, going into how suppliers can engage with us um, and also the kind of information that we have available for them so they can design the best proposals um, to meet our goals. Um, this presentation will focus on those first three steps, but also I'll 
give some information about how we're going to implement the projects. Um, everything from signing the agreement so that suppliers can do their thing, but also how we can use a real market-based approach, how displaced people can pay for energy services um, and ultimately improve their welfare and livelihoods. And finally, but a theme throughout this whole process um, is our monitoring, evaluation and learning framework. How do we monitor progress? How do we provide tailored support throughout all of it? And how do we judge how well we're doing, how well the suppliers are doing, and how do we share that learning and recommendations in the future? The next slide, please. So first up, I'll share some, uh, some of the findings from our RE for our assessment phase. So all of this information is actually going to be coming out in a forthcoming report um, due early next year, which is going to contain all of the information that we found about um, energy access in these three camps. This is going to be, as you can see here, focused just on um, domestic lighting, but we also have information about uh, refugee businesses, community facilities. Um, so a lot of this information was kind of um, verifying some of our initial assumptions. So uh, we had a big focus on how can we quantify energy access um, with a view to giving that information to suppliers to improve it, but also how can we get information about the, um, the real lived experiences of people in these settings. So we also had a large number of focus groups and interviews to um, both verify the kind of data we were getting from our quantitative assessments, um, but also build up a more holistic picture of energy access in the camps. What we found is that most households rely on really basic combinations of different sources of lighting. So as some of the speakers already mentioned, using things like candles, mobile phones, improvised torches um, as the kind of core um, lighting sources that people use. A minority of people in the three camps also had access to solar lanterns and solar home systems. Um, but yeah, like I said, these are really in the minority. Some other interesting things we found is that we managed to quantify the benefits of having these improved products. So stepping up from uh, having a lighting source that's not electric, which is typically candles or improvised torches, up to a solar lantern actually gives you about 45 minutes extra lighting per day. And then doing the same step up from a solar lantern to a solar home system will give you another 45 minutes of lighting a day. We also found that amongst people that didn't have access to a solar home system, people had uh, a relatively modest but non-zero expenditure on lighting, so candles and uh, batteries for their torches. Um, for context there, the exchange rate is roughly 800 around in francs to the dollar, so this is really quite small amounts. Um, but the fact is that there was a small um, market for energy for lighting there. Other things that we found, perhaps unsurprisingly, is when we asked people about their energy priorities in the camps, Households really quite reasonably ranked their own energy needs as the most important to be addressed compared to energy for businesses or energy for their community facilities. Um, as was mentioned before, people were interested in working, studying, doing chores at home, um, using electric lighting, but also the kind of services that people um, really mentioned they wanted were also relatively modest and the kind of things that could be, um, or the kind of demands that could be met with quite uh, really relatively basic solar products like solar lanterns and solar home systems. Uh, next slide, please. And this is how we came to design one of our interventions. So the re for r project is actually implementing four, and this is just a focus on one, which aims to meet uh, the domestic lighting needs amongst households, but also amongst small enterprises. I said earlier that of those steps that I showed, we were going to focus on three. First up, the assessment, which I just mentioned, looking at our survey results, our focus group results, um, and also market assessments. And from that, we came to the conclusion that domestic energy access is very low, but it could also be improved by solar home systems. Our next step was, go through, was to go through a co-design process. So what this was, was a workshop being held in Kigali, which is the capital of Rwanda, um, in May of 2018. And this is bringing together all the stakeholders we thought would have best interest in, um, in designing these interventions to get a kind of group consensus on what is going to be the best suite of interventions to meet uh, the total energy needs of the camp. So, like I said, one of them is renewable energy services for households and small enterprises. The other three are in the box in the bottom left. We also had, or also have interventions around um, improved cooking, solar street lighting, um, and also solar power for institutions. At this workshop, we also came up with the um, the goals of what this intervention should focus on. So 
primarily increasing campfire access to home systems, but also decreasing spending on non-renewable non technologies, um, but also in doing so, ensuring service quality and also elements of training and capacity building for displaced people too. Finally, when we're coming to engaging with suppliers, we did this through a competitive tendering process to select solar home system suppliers to deliver the three interventions in the camps. So it's kind of working with them to work out how we get these, um, these suppliers selling to refugees and refugees paying for energy in a market-based approach. Uh, we limited our um, engagement just to suppliers that were already operating in Rwanda. Um, and then throughout this process, there was a lot of back and forth. So we went through the normal process of going through expressions of interest. They could ask questions about what the goals of the intervention were before putting together proposals that were kind of fit best with their existing business models. And then we could evaluate that and ultimately pick the suppliers that would deliver the intervention. What this allowed us to do is that when suppliers would ask us questions, we could give them tailored support to really work together to work out how can we um, sort of help them help us um, and ultimately de deliver the best interventions that were going to be sustainable in the long term. Next slide, please. So these are the three kind of main learnings that we got from that whole process. Um, so fundamentally, what do suppliers want to know when you're engaging um, and designing these kind of interventions that they're, they're going to be responsible for implementing. So critically and kind of the first step in the door is understanding what the market size is. This is really like need to know data. You need to know what the camp population is, what, where the camps are in the local area, current levels of energy access and the technologies being used. These are all questions. They were the first that popped up when we were engaging with suppliers and also really understanding what we wanted to achieve with our interventions. So being explicit about those goals really helps them design the best proposals. Um, and these are relatively like, tangible, definable things. You know, it can be harder or easier in different situations, but ultimately quite definable, um, which is different from understanding what a supplier's market viability is. And this is inherently um, personal to the supplier, I suppose. So, and it's also a lot harder to quantify. So we can gather information about occupations and income, but how that fits in with the supplier's business model, um, you know, is personal to that supplier. Looking at the livelihoods opportunities, this is kind of less tangible information about you know, the willingness, the ability of people to pay and their expenditure on other sources. Um, getting data on the ability and willingness to pay is inherently very, um, well, it's incredibly tricky and can be incredibly risky. Um, but also is one of the first things that suppliers would ask for. Um, but I think that needs to be treated with really a lot of caution. because I think it's very methodology dependent and it's having a headline figure for these ability and willingness to pay data doesn't always tell the full story. But also from kind of our side, um, it's showing how viable the market was in terms of the support that we were willing to give suppliers in getting their um, getting their products into the camps, getting their businesses operating in the camps. So this is kind of a back and forth process as well, but we can also bundle into supplier support. And this is kind of stakeholder engagement or um, the softer side, I suppose, of this kind of process. So visiting camps with suppliers, demystifying the whole humanitarian space. Because um, I think we should bear in mind that humanitarian settings have a lot of complexities that if you are a business and especially a small business trying to get into that market, that can be very intimidating. Um, we needed to know how we can fit those existing business models into what we were trying to achieve and find some kind of common ground, which ultimately relies on a bit of flexibility on both parties. So we have our intervention goals, but you know, if no one can meet them, we're not gonna be a good position. So finding the middle ground between what we want to achieve and what suppliers think is possible um, was really critical for us. Next slide, please. So from this, we have a few recommendations for supporting market-based interventions. As was mentioned earlier, this can be, um, uh, it's, it's really hard to generalize across every humanitarian situation. So I suppose most of this is relevant to the kind of um, protracted camp-based situation that we were working in. Um, I'd say first and foremost, understanding the situation on the ground and the goals of your intervention is crucial. So some of this information, like I mentioned before, is absolutely critical. You need to know the market size to just get suppliers interested um, in applying for the proposals that you put out. Um, 
and this can be really tricky, but engaging with stakeholders, so this could be UNHCR, it could be the local government um, or other NGOs that are operating in areas that overlap with energy issues can really help inform how your energy interventions can fit in with the wider ecosystem rather than trying to build everything up from scratch. We found it was really important to get triangulation and input from the field level um, to check our assumptions, to kind of get an ear on the ground and like do some ground truthing of what we were assuming and as we were moving forwards. Um, and as I said before, having clarity in the goals and the evaluation process with suppliers was really key. Um, and it just makes their lives a little bit easier when they're putting together a proposal, which you know in itself is a kind of business risk. They're putting in their resources to something that they're not sure will be successful. So we need to be as clear as possible about that whole process. Next up, we need to anticipate what suppliers needs. Like I said, some of this information is critical, but we can try and be reasonable about um, providing information about market viability, which some suppliers found some information very important and others not so much. Um, we need to bear in mind that suppliers will ask for as much information as you can get, of course, like that's in their business interest, but also remaining relatively um, grounded or neutral in some of that data, which can be more speculative. Um, I think it's very important that, especially when talking about expenditure, people's occupations in the camps and their willingness to pay, these can all be really, um, really easy to misinterpret. So we need to be really open about the kind of data that we have, what it can be used for, and um, making sure that we never go one step further than what we kind of know from our information. We should be aware that streamlined assessments are the best kind of assessments. We all operate in a resource constrained environment. So getting the data that we need and nothing more, it's obviously ideal. Um, but we need to be selective about the kind of information that we collect and also doing markets assessments of knowing what kind of business models operate in the country already um, or in the local area around the camps and the wider context. Um, that can be really valuable in designing that assessment process to know how it's gonna feed in to the later stages of intervention support. And finally, working in partnership, um, this may sound really obvious, but I think it's really difficult to do in practice. We need to share knowledge and experience with the private sector. Like I said, it can be really intimidating for a private company to try and engage in humanitarian operations, especially if they've been operating in the wider country, which is you know, what they know. It can be a big, big business risk to move into a new market, move into something they don't understand. That takes resources away from you know, other parts of their business. Um, it can require a lot of work and interaction, especially in the country level. So our in-country teams have to do a lot of kind of management of those conversations, you know, keeping people engaged and making sure that humanitarian settings aren't some big, scary, unknown situation. Like there is a market there, and, you know, we all want that market to succeed. Um, but as experts in the humanitarian side of things, we need to share all the stuff that we've learned and our organizations have learned um, in order to make that transition as easy as possible for them. Um, and finally, coordinating and working together. Ultimately, hopefully, this will be a multi-year project or multi-year um, programs. So just making sure that you're on the same team, you can, can keep supplying that support to one another, because um, ultimately, we're all working towards the same objectives of trying to improve energy access in the camps and in humanitarian settings more widely. Next slide, please. Great, so with that, I'd just like to say thank you for your attention and let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Thank you. Thank you for, um, for sharing your experience for Rwanda and again, highlighting on how important partnerships are and how we can actually foster such kind of partnerships. And I think there are some people who are joining in uh, like right now. So for just to summarize some of the, I wanted to quickly summarize some of the key um, teams that ran again and again among the four presentation for today um, that we discussed again and again is that lightning, when we talk about lightning in the humanitarian camps, we have to understand that it can be thought of as a homogenized unit. We have to think about lightning in different settings that can be in private households or in community settings and so on. And when we look at what kind of lightning solutions are being used, there's like a mixture of different kind of solutions that has been used. And as Rachel pointed out, it also has a gender perspective to it, so which is also important. And finally, all the, the fact that all the presentation is stressed on is this need for private sector or need or potential for private sector to get involved in. 
and also a need for quality products. So with that quite a short summary, I wanted to move to the Q&A session. Since one of our presenter has to quickly leap, uh, Rachel, so maybe I can direct the first question already to you, Rachel. So if you can quickly unmute yourself, um, I can already ask you the first question. Rachel? Yes, hello. Ah, super. So the first question that has been asked to you is, you talked about the graveyard problem in humanitarian settings. So if you could um, once again explain what, in your opinion, could be a solution to it, and if you had seen any problem that actually managed to solve it, uh, any program that managed to solve it. Well, I can't claim to to know every setting where this has happened, um, but we we did find uh, when we did our literature review um, lots of research that pointed to this, and I have myself seen some where mm -hmm. there are these defunct solar systems. Uh, one of the big drivers of that is short-term donor funding. Um, so so the 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 ways to um, uh, maintain those systems. Uh, are, are lost after the initial funding. Um, so, but but that is not an insurmountable problem if we plan mm -hmm. properly and we work with communities. Um, what we um, tried doing in the Rohingya camp, where we were putting in uh, streetlights, um, was having having these committees who were responsible for them, who checked the maintenance. Uh, vandalism is a, a it was a huge problem. Uh, and I actually spoke to groups of children who, who, you know, the game was to see how many stones you could, you could hit onto the bulbs. Um, so, so there's a lot around um, tackling those problems by getting, getting community ownership. Um, I would be interested to hear other people's experiences. Um, if anyone has really cracked this. Uh, and, and we are just waiting to see what happens over the longer term with with these committees that we've got um, that are maintaining the lights and, and and dealing with the social and community aspect of them. Support. Does anybody want to join in and support Rachel? Um, if anyone is interested, just unmute yourself and you can continue the conversation. Um, it seems like uh, nobody's actually jumping in. So I think we have to let Rachel go now because she has to rush. But now I come back to Chris so, uh, and both Nicole. Um, I'll quickly read out the question for you guys. So the question to Chris and Nicole is the issue of need for larger and AC appliances such as refrigerators is documented. What are the speakers' experience on the trade-offs between small affordable DCS solar home system, systems now that they may be ultimately be thrown away when they outgrow versus serving fewer people with a more permanent grip? So basically, what do you think um, about small solar home systems, which um, might have, uh, be of good quality standard, but then again, we touch upon the problem that um, they might just outgrow their need and you have to throw them and then comes the problem of the graveyard. Uh, Nicole, Chris, do you want to address that? Okay, I'll quickly try to unmute both of you. Uh, yeah, hi, this is Chris. Um, that is interesting. Um, uh, first, I'm not sure I'm in full agreement that um, once a, a user or consumer <clears throat> feels that they're um, solar home system or, or lighting kit um, does no longer fulfill all their needs that it will end up in the in the garbage. Um, uh, if there is evidence of that, I would, I would be interested in seeing that. Um, we do know, um, we do have evidence of, um, of consumers uh, climbing up the energy ladder, so to speak. So um, we have seen that um, there's kind of a you know gateway product, so to speak. Um, they get an experience with investing hard-earned money into a uh, solar lantern, for example, um, and then have a great experience and decide that they're willing to uh, further invest in, in larger systems. Um, and so uh, I think that is a, is a positive thing. Um, but uh, that, that's about all I have to say. But um, if there is evidence that um, products go to waste after they're 
um, deemed uh, not sufficient, I, I would be interested in seeing that. Superb. So yes, um, a question to the audience. So if you have any uh, such study or such remarks, please tap in your remarks and we'll be happy to share it with everybody. But I think that's also a very interesting point that you mentioned that the energy ladder, which is something uh, we have to look more into. Um, Nicole, do you want to add something to it? Well, I would say that, you know, it, it's totally true. And I believe that, as Chris said, whenever um, they invest in a lantern and then want to pass to a solar home system, that doesn't mean that the lantern is goes in the garbage. They can keep the lantern and use it for, um, I don't know, to, for, to light their um, bathroom that is outside or to, to bring it around. And, and, um, and, you know, you find different usages for, uh, for um, the lantern that you bought in the past. Um, and also their component-based systems where you can just add another battery, for example, and you can increase the loads that you can support. So um, I guess it's it's the way you see it. It's you're putting to use the prior system or you're adding more to that system. It just doesn't go in the garbage. True. And I think one more point to add to that would be also passing it to your relatives, which happens a lot of, in, at least in Asian contexts. Um, coming myself from an Asian country, I've seen that you also pass on when you buy a newer, bigger TV or a bigger system, you pass on your old system to your less fortunate relatives as well. So there's always this passing on. So maybe that could also be an option to look at. Um, now I wanted to move on to a question about e-waste generation. Um, so this is more addressed to Cecilia, uh, but uh, I encourage everyone to jump in if you have a point. So this to Cecilia, the question is, on e-waste generation due to distribution of low quality solar products, especially during emergency periods, do you build into your program an e-waste management intervention? If yes, how? Um, so Cecilia, if you can, I will just yep. quickly, un yeah. So I please go ahead. <laughs> uh, thanks for the question. It's actually a very relevant one. And again, it speaks about uh, the quality of the products that we deployed. Um, as I was trying to explain uh, during the conversation, we just uh, deploy even uh, in the very first uh, short uh, distribution intervention that we do, lighting global products. So we have uh, really like uh, the quality insurance aspect uh, there. Uh, um, it's not that uh, after the no couple of months, uh, you have to throw away your product. But totally true. Um, I think that we are not paying enough attention to what um, the energy waste uh, uh, could uh, do. Uh, in the countries of intervention and of course uh, we know that even uh, in our world uh, where we live i'm clearly from europe um, this problem probably has not been addressed as it should be um, and we are trying uh, to build uh, the sustainability strategy also around that but i have to be honest i don't think that we are good enough and again uh, as uh, uh, nicole and others were saying before if you have actually references uh, around this issue please do share them Superb. and once again uh, nicole and chris do you want to add something to that point um chris do you uh, want to add yeah. something yes yeah. yes i would um, just to um, flag up the fact that the industry association uh, for these products, the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association, GOGLA, um, has been uh, focusing on the topic of e-waste for several years now. Um, so many leaders um, uh, in the manufacturing of these products um, do uh, consider um, uh, how to, how to handle electronic waste at the end of the lifetime. Um, so just to note that there is work being done, done on that, but um, as others have noted, it's uh, a pretty big challenge considering that there's um, a very big deficit in terms of the infrastructure for um, any sort of um, reclamation or recycling of, of electronic waste um, in these, these key markets and, and where humanitarian organizations are operating um, so that in itself is a, a logistical and and a, a financial um, question uh, so you know if an organization has a um, plan to um, take back uh, non-functional uh, equipment um, it's a pretty large um, 
burden um, in terms of logistics and cost to then um, effectively ship it to a place where um, the the um, waste can be can be processed properly. Um, we've seen in in some African countries there is um, infrastructure for uh, lead-based battery uh, recycling, um, but other than that, there's a real a real gap there. So um, I, I do see this as an opportunity that um, organizations can build into their programs um, budget for reclaiming these these items and and possibly even um, uh, developing infrastructure and 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 trained um, uh, repair people, uh, so maintenance and repair uh technicians that can can keep products lasting for a longer time thanks thank you and again shout out to all the private sector that are listening to us right now please um, have a look at the equist there is uh, as chris mentioned there is a huge gap in it um i quickly want to be, uh, bring in philip philip do you have any more point to add to that or else i also have a next question for you so if you could quickly unmute yours uh, yeah you are unmuted yeah, I think the other speakers have covered that topic pretty well. So, yeah, feel free for the next question. Super. So the question that came for you is you talked about demystifying the humanitarian sector for the suppliers. But what does that mean in terms of activity and how do you do it? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, well, the first thing I say is I think this will be very context dependent, but I think there's some general kind of rules of thumb that you can use. So, um, well, Let's take into account the fact that many of the kind of off-grid lighting companies, there are some big established players, but many of them are relatively small, which means they're going to be very resource constrained. So yeah, entering this market is going to be tricky. So it's not a case of holding their hand through that process, but it's kind of guiding them and showing the way. So this can be things like, um, uh, for example, bringing them in into um, discussions or kind of workshops about how the humanitarian sector operates either in general or um, in that local national context because those two things might be quite different um, to kind of show them like which organizations are responsible for what how mm -hmm. that aligns with what they're normally used to and so let's say they're um, very comfortable with um, for example talking to the government agency responsible for electrification in that country you know, knowing that there's also an analogous organization about refugee affairs and knowing how those two government entities um, interact with one another and who's um, who will be responsible for what kind of issues in that humanitarian context will also be quite important. Um, I think you should bear in mind that the organizations that have been speaking here have a lot of experience in humanitarian settings and sometimes that involves just kind of sitting down and talking with stakeholders and answering their questions. Mm. Um, which maybe sounds very straightforward, but this can be really like back to basic kind of stuff. Like, for example, as a company, am I allowed to sell in a refugee camp? Do I need to set up a shop that's just outside? Um, like what kind of rights do refugees have in this country? These can all be like relatively difficult to get a concrete answer from um, mm. or an official answer from. Um, and yeah, how these things operate in practice can also be quite different. So guiding those companies through that process and having relationships with those companies, like personal relationships, like conversations, um, is really a good way to engage them in the first instance. Super, thank you so much. Um, so now I'll just move to my final question that's for Cecilia. And since we're also to nearing towards the end of the webinar, so the question to Cecilia is, when you talk about Afghanistan and um, with this energy portfolio program in Afghanistan, you mentioned that the market was already distorted. So how challenging was it to in, uh, go into the such kind of distorted market? And how do you address it where um, the market is already distorted by cheap product or the willingness to pay for good quality products is not there? Um, Cecilia, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's fine. I was just checking if Baralai uh, actually wanted to answer it with this question as it's really his country. Uh, mm -hmm. But otherwise, uh, I can just give like a broader answer. Um, I think Baralai is not answering. Okay, so market distortion. Of course, like uh, when uh, we are giving uh, out uh, free hands out, um, the value that people attributed to these things definitely diminishes and uh, again uh, this is why we are so against uh, in kind of distributions 
Uh, at the same time, though, when uh, quality is not assured in uh, any given product, uh, people tend not to make uh, the investment, considering also the very limited resources that they have. This is why we are really trying uh, to first uh, push in uh, the humanitarian setting for these uh, um, cash initiatives, where um, international organization uh, starts really promoting a cash distribution instead of in-kind distributions so people could actually make these choices for uh, themselves and at the same time uh, working with uh, uh, quality control authorities uh, within the countries where we work to ensure that, that there's this push for uh, increased quality also from uh, the regulators within the country. Um, I hope that this hands works otherwise let me know. Super, thank you so much. Um, and with that, my last question, we come to us the end of the webinar. And before we, I let all of you guys go, um, I wanted to quickly, as from the webinar team, we wanted to apologize because we had some technical difficulties towards the beginning and then because of which you, uh, you might have noticed that you got another link to join the webinar. So thank you to all of you for joining the webinar and sorry for the technical difficulties that we had. As you can see on my uh, final slides, that if you have any feedback about the webinar, please, please do feel free to send it at info at nhpdia.info. We will address all your feedbacks. And I know there are still some questions that we couldn't answer, but we'll try to um, see if we can get them answers and post it online on NGPedia. And also, as you can see on the screen, you can always find the webinar documentation at this link, which will also be sent um, after the webinar in a follow-up email. And finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have another webinar coming up on 20th November. So please, guys, let's register for, uh, register for this webinar. And yeah, you can hear from another group of experts about why sustainable energy for household cooking is needed or how do you, what kind of interventions is needed in humanitarian settings. So after I close this webinar, a quick tip, um, a, a pop-up survey, survey will pop up. So please use this survey to tell us uh, what did you like or did not like or what are the topics you want us to look at, uh, look at in this webinar series. And now finally, a huge thank you to all our experts for all your valuable contribution and presentation. Thank you to all our listeners for staying with us towards the end. And now I wish you a good day and thank you once again. Bye-bye.